Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates, and here at No Limits, we want to help strengthen you, encourage you, and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin, and I want to thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. Well, today I'm going to begin a four-part sermon series entitled Enemies of the Heart. I want to deal with those emotional and mental blockages that can clog the spiritual arteries of our heart, hearts. And so I want to invite you to join us over the next several weeks together as we start this sermon series entitled Enemies of the Heart. But today, I want to invite you to turn with me to the gospel according to John chapter 14. And I want to read in your hearing verses 1 through 7 as we get this series started today. That's the gospel according to John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, where the word of the Lord reads as follows. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the place and where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes through the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, do you know him and have seen him? Amen and amen. I want to talk today from the thought how to deal with a troubled heart how to deal with a troubled heart. Right. Now, I realize this at the outside of this message, that I'm probably dating myself when I say this, but one of my favorite sitcoms growing up was Sanford and Son. Sanford and Son was that edgy, humorous series that ran in the mid-70s starring comedian Red Fox, who played Fred Sanford and DeMond Wilson, who played his son Lamont. The program, as many of you know, profiled the struggles and challenges they faced and the antics and schemes they often got involved in trying to financially manage and maintain a junkyard business in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. The show was a huge success, and it continues to be so in syndication to this very day. Well, one of the comedic routines that used to crack me up every time I saw it was the one centered around Fred's alleged heart attack, heart problem. Whenever something shocking was said or done or whenever Fred uh, encountered a situation that was distressing, he would look up to heaven with his hand on his chest and fake a heart attack while calling out to his late wife, Elizabeth, saying, this is the big one, Elizabeth. I'm coming to join you, honey. Many of you are laughing right now just thinking about Fred raised Lamont all by himself. And Fred missed Elizabeth deeply. And so whenever something happened that really stressed him out, whenever something happened that turned his world upside down, whenever things weren't going the way that he thought that they would, Fred would gesture that there was something wrong with his heart. Fred's fake heart attack was hilarious on the show. But matters of the heart, church, are no laughing matter in real life. The heart is so central to the body, so significant for our health, that failure to care for, maintain, and protect the heart has results in 17 million Americans dying each year from heart-related conditions. And as central as the heart is to our physical well-being, the heart is even of greater importance to our spiritual well-being as well. 
For when the heart experiences shock and sadness, when the heart encounters trouble and trauma, heartache and hurt, it can weigh us down mentally and emotionally, and if left untreated, it can literally tear us apart. It is why so many people suffer from depression. It is why so many people wrestle with anxiety, fear, and worry because they have conditions of the heart that have gone unchecked. And now it is literally tearing their lives asunder. It is no wonder then that in one of his last earthly conversations with his disciples that Jesus spoke to them about caring for the heart. He says to them in our text, let not your heart be troubled. The Greek word for heart here is the word cardia, where we get words like cardiac and cardiologist. But the Greek word for heart is more than a mere reference to the physical organ of the body, the heart. Cardia refers to the internal essence of a person. It refers to the seat of one's decision making. It refers to the control center of one's body. In the ancient world, the heart was more than just an organ that pumped blood throughout the body. It was seen as interconnected to the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, the heart was connected to the core of one's thoughts, one's drive, and one's feeling. The heart was seen as that which gave life to the desires, the thoughts, and the feelings of an individual. Jesus then places places the center of his conversation about the heart in the context of a troubled heart one that is worried and weighed down, one that, is, that is, is tense, a heart that is at the end of the day, the heart that is stressed out. The word translated trouble means agitated. It, it refers to a deep spiritual uh, disruption or a mental pain that results in an internal struggle. It's like a war, a battle on the inside, and Jesus says to them, don't allow the negative circumstances around you or the things that have agitated you or the situations that cause you anxiety to create tension and conflict in your heart. Are y'all with me here today? Jesus says, don't let it linger in your heart. Don't let it hang out on the inside of your body. Don't don't leave it unattended because if you do, it'll cause you some major problems. For the disciples, the challenge they were about to face was the prospect of Jesus no longer being with them physically after his death. They struggled with what his departure meant for their lives, their future, and their protection. They wondered how would they make it now that their master was no longer with them? Who would would be there to answer their questions, to calm their fears, to help them defeat their enemies? Who would be the one to help them to deal with their challenges? Who would they be able to, to call upon to give them strength and encouragement, to move them to press on, to fight on, to see what the end is going to be if Jesus is not around. And yet, Jesus' instruction to them then and us now was, uh, don't allow the external troubles and challenges uh, that you face on the outside manifest in an inner burden and struggle that will affect who you are on the inside. Jesus did not want the reality of his departure to cause and to create toxic levels of stress that would trouble and ultimately overwhelm their lives. And oh, (laughs) Oh, how relevant that is for many of us today. Because the fact of the matter is there are many of us right now who are suffering from a troubled heart. And we are suffering not simply due to the circumstances of life, but we are suffering by the unhealthy ways that we try to handle our problems. Are y'all here worrying? Uh, Some of us worry ourselves to death. And as a consequence, it is troubling our hearts. Some of us trouble our hearts by rehearsing over and over again the negativity that we are going through. We call our prayer partners rehearsing the negativity. Y'all aren't here. 
We, we write down in our journals, uh, uh, rehearsing the negativities uh, over and over again. Some of us engage in self-destructive behavior like drinking and smoking and overeating and overspending. Uh, others try to handle our problems uh, by avoiding uh, our problems. Uh, but just because you avoid conflict does not mean you are dealing with your conflict. These responses uh, tend to mask the underlying issues uh, and they end up exacerbating our problems uh, and rather than making them better, we end up making them worse. And to prevent that from happening, Jesus tells them then and he tells us now, don't let your hearts be troubled. Uh, what, what, what is he saying here? Uh, what he is saying is uh, don't let what you're facing uh, contaminate and to pollute your heart. Don't let the tension around you, uh, don't let the trouble you're experiencing stress your heart out so much that it overwhelms and consumes your body. Can I ask you something? I said, can I ask you something? What is troubling your heart? What is the issue about which you're worrying that has begun to overwhelm you and is controlling your mind, your spirit, and your life? Is it growing up without a father who was present? Is it the fact that you are single and all your friends are married and you're constantly the matron of honor? Is it some past abuse? Is it guilt or jealousy? Have you allowed a breakup to permanently fracture your heart and to prevent you from falling in love again? What is troubling your heart? Is it a problem at home, a problem in the relationship, or maybe you're troubled by some other unhappiness, but whatever it is, if you're honest with yourself, many of us are struggling with a troubled heart. But can I tell you something? <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> Whatever you're wrestling with, <laughs> Jesus says, don't let any of this get into the driver's seat of your heart and to take control of your life. Uh, Jesus says, let, don't let your fears, your frustrations, uh, and your failings clog the spiritual arteries of your life, preventing you from being and doing what God wants you to do. And I want to tell somebody here today, don't you allow what you have gone through keep you from being and doing what God wants you to do. Because if you're not careful, a troubled heart can keep you from being the blessed child of God, the father, the mother, the husband, the wife, the son, and the daughter, the preacher, the pastor that God has called you to be. Have I got a witness today? And in order to deal with a troubled heart, this text suggests, first of all, that you've got to learn to trust God's plan. Come on, type in the comment section, trust God's plan. Yeah, trust God's plan. Jesus tells his disciples that the reason they don't have to worry is because his departure is a part of a broader plan. In response to their fears and questions, Jesus redirects their focus from fear to their future, from the pain of their problem to the promise of God's plan. And while none of them wanted to face what, they, what was about to happen, he wanted to help them to understand that what they were about to go through was a part of something greater that was orchestrated by the hand of God. I feel like preaching. They didn't have to worry because God had a plan, a plan for their lives, a plan for their future a plan for their family, a plan for their faith, and a plan for their redemption. What they were facing was just a variable within the context of something greater that God had preordained, that God had prearranged, and get this, he had done it for their good. Can I tell you something? God has been pre-arranging and pre-ordaining us something, and he is doing it for your good. Have I got a witness? They had a choice. 
they could either wallow in their sadness or they could see their situation as a setup for something greater. Have I got a witness here today? That's some good news for someone listening to me right now because while you're, while you're focused on what you're seeing, God says it's just a setup for something greater. Have I got a witness listening? I want to tell someone here today that what you are facing is not final. It's just a setup for something greater. Have somebody ought to shout and bless God right there that what I'm going through is just a setup for something greater. He's setting my family up. He's setting my faith up. He's setting my finances up for something greater. And here's the shout. You don't have to wait till you see it to praise God. You can bless him in advance. Somebody ought to shout and bless God at home. You ought to thank him for an advanced promotion. You ought to thank him for advanced victory. You ought to thank him for advanced provision. And when you talk to your haters, and when you talk to your prognosticators, and they know what you're going through, they know the problem in the relationship, they know your medical situation, they ask you, how can you smile when you know what the doctor is saying? You just tell him, I'm thanking God for what he's setting up in advance. Have I got a witness listening? Come on, somebody shout and praise God at home. Praise God in the kitchen. Praise God by your bed that he's just setting me up for something greater. Look, I'm at church by myself. Y'all could at least help me to praise God while you're at home. But is there anybody here today who can thank God that when I look back over my life, all of my problems were merely stepping stones for something greater, a greater promise, a greater purpose, and a greater plan. See, all too often, we allow our predicaments to paralyze us and to prevent us from seeing how what we're going through is really a part of something greater and better. Have you ever looked back over your life and said, Lord, I thank him for my problems now. I thank him for my mountains now. I thank him for my valleys now because he was just setting me up for something bigger, for something better. Have I got a witness listening? And here's the thing that we can be assured of, and that's this, that if God permits it, he's going to use it. Oh, y'all missed your shout. That if God allowed it, he's going to use it for your good. That's why Paul said in Romans 8, 28, that all things, somebody say all things, say it again, all things, the layoff, the divorce, uh, the, the breakdown, the frustration, all things are working together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. I, I'm feeling good in here today. So if God permitted it in your life, he's going to use it, honey, for your good. Disappointments. <laughs> mistakes, setbacks, shortcomings, stabbing you in the back, calling you everything but a child of God. It was all prearranged. It's just a scheduled pit stop en route to your destination. Have I got a witness here today? And we must be assured not to miss the power of our problems by assuming that what God intends to be a comma. You think it's a period. The devil is a lie. Have I got a witness? This ain't a period. This not the end of the chapter. This not the end of the book. This ain't the end of your story. You got another paragraph. You got another chapter that God is trying to write in the book of your life. 
have I got a witness here? Is there anybody can shout and thank God that God's still writing another chapter, that God is still writing another paragraph. And when I come through this, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be wiser. Have I got a witness in here today? Jesus was telling them what he's telling us now. Not to allow the challenging circumstances to incarcerate your spirit. That it causes your heart to become troubled. Yeah. I learned something while watching the movie Harriet on the life of Harriet Tubman. Yeah. We all know her for her heroism and for freeing slaves during 19 trips back to the South. But what I did not know was that Harriet's initial plans were not to go there to free all of those people. When she first went back, she went back to find the man that she was married to before she escaped. Y'all not here. When she first went back, she went to reconnect with, with a man who, who, who was her husband, so she thought. But when she got there, she learned that her man had remarried another woman and that he had no interest in being with her. And when he said, I don't want to be with you anymore. The story says that she went and sat up under a tree and she started crying and she was under that tree snotting and crying and then the Lord spoke. I want to tell somebody listening who's sitting up under your tree snotting and crying about who walked out on you, about who left you, about who's talking about you to listen up. Come on, type in the comments and says, and listen up. And here's what God said. Yeah. God said to her, you thought I brought you back here to find a man. Uh, Lord have mercy. You thought I brought you back here to free your husband. But I brought you back here to free your people. Have I got a witness? And in that moment, she discovered that in the midst of her pain, that God had a plan for her life. Have I got a witness? And I want to tell somebody here that God has got a plan for every trial, for every trouble, for every tribulation, for every trauma. God has got a plan for every enemy, for every hater, and every hater is don't be an elevator to your next elevation. Have I got a witness? Is there anybody here who can thank God that I pray the way I pray? I worship the way I worship. I preach the way I preach because of what I went through. Have I got a witness? And when Jesus says to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me. He was trying to help them to understand that his plan was not earthly, it was heavenly. It was not mundane, it was eternal. And even though what they were going through was different, that he had something greater on the other side. If I had a mind, I tell somebody listening, you might as well stop crying. You might have might as well wipe your last tear. Because God has got something greater on the other side. Have I got a witness that regardless of your problem and regardless of your pain and regardless of the person and regardless of the predicament that God has got something greater? Have I got a witness here today? Y'all making me preach too hard. I'm still, I'm still on the runway. The first point is if you want to deal with a troubled heart, you got to learn how to trust God's plan. Glory to God. But, but secondly, if you want to deal with a troubled heart, if you want to 
deal with a troubled heart. <laughs> You're going to have to be honest about the process. <laughs> Come on, somebody say be honest. Be honest. I, I can't hear you say be honest. Be honest. About the process. Yeah. The process. Yeah. See, <laughs> one of the most maligned characters in Christian history is a disciple presented and identified here in verse 5 as Thomas. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Thomas, his name is often prefaced with an adjective, uh, doubting, <laughs> which describes or refers to the way in which he constantly appears in Scripture as questioning or, or voicing his uncertainty about the plans of the Lord, doubting Thomas. The problem with Thomas isn't that he's unwilling to fight and to die for Jesus. Christian tradition shows that he is and that he is willing to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. The issue with Thomas is he just needs everything to be proven or explained to him. He's got to understand it with his mind. Uh, because uh, until he is convinced, he's just not blindly going to go along. Yeah, uh, 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 Thomas is the educated disciple. Yeah, he went to school. He took a philosophy class. He took a, relig a theology class. And so he's just not going to go on the blind faith. <laughs> And what I like about Thomas, however, is that he is not ashamed <laughs> to express his doubts. I need y'all to hold on here. <laughs> I like that Thomas is, is not ashamed to express the struggle that he is having when it comes to following the Lord. When Jesus foreshadows his departure and, and says that his disciples know the way, Thomas responds by saying, Lord, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> Uh, how can we know the way? <laughs> and I, I want to be honest with you. I don't know why Thomas did not know the answer to that question. <laughs> Perhaps it's because he missed class that day. <laughs> like he missed Jesus' appearance in John chapter 20 after the Lord's resurrection, leading him to proclaim, unless I see the scars, the marks, the nails in his hands, and until I put my finger in the mark of the nails and my, 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 my fingers in his side, I'm not going to believe. Perhaps he missed class that day. But, but whatever the reason... I don't want to castigate Thomas today for being the disciple who doubted. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't want to wave my proverbial finger at Thomas for being the disciple who didn't have one. I don't want to be that guy, no. I, I want to see in Thomas something redemptive about his uh, transparency with God. I, I'm working on something here. At least Thomas had the courage enough at least he had the fortitude enough to express the uncertainty in his mind and the fear in his heart. Yeah, I like the fact that Reverend Thomas didn't have to come to church with a collar around his neck and, and to act like he had it all together. Yeah, at least he had the temerity and the boldness to express his res res reservations with God rather than feeling like he had to come to church and put on a front around everybody just to be in the Jesus circle. Y'all not here? How I got a witness? At least Thomas is not afraid to be honest about how he feels about what's going on. At least he's not afraid to be honest about how he feels about what he's going through. And Thomas does not succumb to the pressure to act as if he's got no doubts and no issues and no struggles just to go along, to get along with everybody else in the church. Thomas seems to tap into one of the key therapeutic principles of a healthy heart. 
Are y'all listening here? And that is the, the, the ability to be honest about where you are and how you feel about what you're facing in life. See, I've discovered that too many people, especially those in the church, feel a need to suppress their fears and their frustrations and their anxieties because they're afraid that people in the church will look at them and say that they lack proper faith. Y'all aren't here. Uh, I, 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 uh, it bothers me uh, that we make people in the church feel uh, as if they got to put on a front and act as if they have it all together when the fact of the matter is they go at home and they can't sleep at night. And they go home and they're wrestling with their marriage and they go home and they're wondering about their finances. But Thomas models for us that expressing my fears rather than suppressing them is the healthiest thing you can do. Have I got a witness here? Y'all aren't here today. Just, just recently, we learned in Bible study that in Nehemiah chapter 1, that when Nehemiah learned that the walls around his hometown of Jerusalem had been torn down and destroyed, that Nehemiah was greatly distressed and grieved. And the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 that Nehemiah sat down and he wept and mourned for days because Nehemiah understood that sometimes you got to confront some stuff. Sometimes you got to address some stuff. And sometimes you got to express the pain of what you're feeling rather than feeling the pressure to come into the house of God and perpetrate like you're not phased and bothered when really it's eating you up on the inside. And I'm talking to somebody here today and you're wrestling on the inside because you got three kids looking at you. They have missed dinner. They missed breakfast. They're wondering how food is going to be kept on the table and you don't even know yourself because your job let you go four weeks ago and the unemployment check is just not enough and God wants me to tell you that the best thing you can do is to express what's happening in your heart. Have I got a witness? See, we do people a disservice. We do Christians a disservice when we make them feel as if they got to act as if everything is okay. Uh, when they, we make them feel that they got to come to the missionary meeting and act as if they're all on board with everything. When they show up to uh, usher board auxiliary number two and they got to act as if they don't have any anxieties to, uh, uh, just because they're a child of God. Where Thomas shows us that I can be a child of God just as I am with my doubts with my issues, with my anxieties, knowing that whatever I'm going through, the Lord can handle it. Have I got a witness? Come on, look at your neighbor right there in the kitchen. I don't care if it's your kids. And tell them the Lord can handle it. Come on, type in the comments, the Lord can handle it. Yeah, he can handle your fears. He can handle your frustration. I remember in Mark chapter 9, when we read about this man who had a son possessed by a demon. When his son was brought to Jesus, Jesus asked the man, do you believe? And I, I remember the man's response. The man's response, he was very honest. He said, Lord, I believe but I need you to help me in the area of my unbelief. Uh, the man was expressing uh, one of the deepest human realities of life. He was saying, Lord, I trust you. 
Uh, but I got some fears and some doubts right now. I've got a witness here. And are there any honest saints who can say, Lord, I trust you. Uh, but I got some doubts about whether you can bring my child, whether you can bring my family, whether you can bring my church during this season. Uh, have I got, I like that Jesus was savior enough to handle the man's honesty. I like the fact that Jesus is savior enough to handle Thomas's questions because it lets us know that when we come to God, you don't have to put on a mask of perfection. You can just be honest. Come on, type in the comments, just be honest with God. Come on, look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, just be honest with God. If you want to deal with a troubled heart, if you want to have a healthy heart, the process is you can't suppress. You got to express. Have I got a witness? Thomas was a faithful disciple, but he was a complex individual. I heard an old preacher say that there is enough good in the worst of us and enough bad in the best of us that it's in the best interest of all of us not to throw any of us away. All of us are a mixture of some good and bad, faith and frustration, trust and fear. And what I like about Jesus is you can bring it all to him. Have I got a witness? Is there anybody here who can thank God that I can bring my fears, I can bring my frustration without having to bottle it up? Come on, look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, if you conceal it, you can't heal it. Somebody ought to tweet that, that you can't heal what you conceal. Have I got a witness? Psychologists tell us that the worst thing you can do is bottle up your emotion. Have I got a witness? Go ahead, give it to God. Give him your fears. Give him your frustration. Give him your sadness. Give him your anxiety. Because God can heal it if you don't conceal it. Have I got a witness? And what I like about Mount Enon, and what I like about Mount Enon is that you don't have to come to Mount Enon uh, wearing a mask. You know, it's a lot of people who are like mummies. You know, I did research on Egyptian mummies. And when the kings were buried, they used to bury them in a gold casket, in a gold room, wearing a gold mask, wrapped in a fine linen. But with all of that gold inside of a gold room, in a gold casket, underneath a gold mask, is nothing but dead bones. And then it hit me. It doesn't matter what you cover yourself up with on the outside or what kind of mask you wear. If you're dead on the inside, have I got a witness? Don't live your life trying to mask the hurt, trying to mask disappointment, and trying to mask the fear. You gonna kill yourself trying to perpetrate being fake and phony and counterfeit. Yeah! I like that Thomas had the faith enough to come to Jesus just as he was and say, Lord, I surrender. I, I don't understand it all. I don't have it all together. And I want to tell somebody here today that the reason we can thank God is because the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect, somebody say every respect, has been tested like we are. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He 
will guide us till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, type in that Jesus knows. Yeah, Jesus knows. I'm praising because he knows. I'm worshiping because he knows. Yes. And you will get help for your troubled heart when you trust God's plan. Glory to God. When, when you realize that the problem is a part of the process. And finally, when you rest in God's peace. Tell your neighbor, rest in God's peace. Glory to God. Uh, Jesus says to him, I, I got a place for you where you can rest from the problems of this world. I got a place where there is peace on the other side of the stress and the anxiety. Glory to God that you are facing down here. I got a place for you where the weary shall cease from troubling and the weary shall be at rest. I, I got a place for you. And I don't know about you, but one of these old days, when this life is over, I'll fly away to a land beyond that celestial shore. I'll fly away. Yeah. 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 Is there anybody here who can say, I got peace. I got problems, but I got peace. I'm in a storm, but I got peace. Difficult time, but I got peace. Have I got a witness? Is there anybody here who can thank God for peace? His peace is unsurpassable. He's got a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace to help me face the unfaceable. A peace to help me bear the unbearable. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Yeah, yeah, hallelujah, his name is peace. Isaiah said, uh, and the child has been given to us, for well, unto us a son has been given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, yeah, yeah, hallelujah, thank you Jesus, Woo! glory, glory, hallelujah, thank you Lord, hallelujah, Woo! thank you Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on, praise him right where you are. Come on, praise him right in your home. Praise him at the kitchen table. Hallelujah. Come on, praise him. Let everything that has bread. Woo, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's got a plan for your life. This problem is not a period. It's a comma. There's more that the Lord desires to write in the chapter of your life. No, this is not the beginning of the end. This is the end of the beginning. You're just getting started, honey. Woo. Just say, I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. God has a plan. Not only, you, only that, you got to understand something about God's process. Thomas says, 
and you can come to God and you can express your anxieties and your fears to him. Yes. Just tell him, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand how a job I, I dedicated myself to could get rid of me after all of this time. I don't understand how someone I was faithful to could cheat on me and betray. I, I don't understand. I believe in this institution called marriage. I, I don't understand, God. I, I don't understand how I could be at this point in my life. That's a part of the process. And if you do that, understand his plan and understand that the authenticity of the process. Glory to God. You can find peace. And you can find rest. Hallelujah. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. And look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. I created No Limits to help you strengthen your daily walk with God. And there is no better way to start your day than with the No Limits Daily Devotion email. Each devotion contains a passage from scripture and some insight to inspire you to feel God's love and to live a life with no limits. You can sign up today to start receiving the daily email by going to delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. Thank you in advance for signing up for the daily devotion email and I pray that it helps you to live each day with no limits. Hello, I wanna thank you for watching the broadcast today and I have an exciting announcement for you. The No Limits free mobile app is now available for both Apple and Android devices. I want to invite you to download the app right now. Simply go to the App Store on your phone and search for No Limits with Pastor Delman to find and download the free app. Or you can go to a special page on our ministry website to find the direct link to download the app. The page is found at delmancoats.org forward slash mobile. And with the No Limits app, you can watch my messages, read daily devotionals, access the entire Bible, and much, much more. And before I go, let me ask you for a favor. If you like what you see on the app, please tell your family and friends about it, as we want to connect with more people to help them live a life with no limits. Thank you again for watching the message today, and know that I'm praying for you to be strengthened in your walk with the Lord, and I ask that you please pray for me each time that you watch. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.